Well, greetings, friends, in the lovely name of Jesus. Welcome to another altar chat. We're coming to you from our cathedral here in Lexington, Tennessee, from the altar, hence the altar chat. We're going to continue our series. This will be part three, and hopefully we will be concluding it on the gifts of the Spirit. And if you haven't already viewed part one and part two, I want to encourage you to do that. Now, uh, probably to get the most out of this altar chat, you will need to have seen the previous two. But this altar chat will be pretty much self-contained and you will be blessed by it even if you have not watched the other two. But if you haven't, after you watch this one, then let me suggest humbly that you go back and view the other two to bring you up to speed. And I think that uh, then when you see this part three, that uh, you will uh, understand why I am asking that. <clears throat> Hi, I am Bishop Jerry Hayes and uh, of the Apostolic Orthodox Church International. Before we get into our uh, altar chat today, I, I want to remind you of our information box right down below. And I, I would ask you to click like, uh, uh, subscribe, and share. Because the more likes we get, the more subscriptions we get, and the more shares that we get, uh, this makes our programming uh, visible and available to more people on the worldwide internet because it raises our status um, in the uh, algo uh, al algorithms so that we are more accessible. So please do that. It costs you nothing to do that. Just click like, share, and subscribe to this channel if you have not already. Also, I want to ask you to visit our giving information and pray about becoming a supporter of uh, the Disciples of the Way as we are constantly uh, presenting a plethora of uh, study material that is good for the layman, the pastor, the teacher, and just the Christian in general. The Lord bless you for doing that, and I thank you for doing it. Now let's go to God in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you who sit upon the circle of the earth, I ask that you illumine all in us that is darkness today, and on our minds that we might perceive truth, and on our hearts that we might believe truth, and anoint our lips that we might speak the truth with clarity and conviction. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom is the Father who made us, the Son who saved us, and the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us, one God, world without end. Having prayed, having made our literal introduction, now let's go right to the Word of God. Now, we're going, we left off last time in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 <clears throat> and in verse 12. <coughs> Excuse me. There in verse 12, the Apostle Paul writes, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Now we're going to begin with verse 13. But before we do that, let me just go back and bring us up to speed. Give me just a couple of minutes right here. The saints at Corinth had written to Paul and had asked him certain questions uh, that they sought answers to. And we read about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul says, Now concerning the things that you ask of me, 
And then Paul goes in to responding to a litany of subjects that they had inquired of him. It, uh, the, the subjects concerned marriage. It uh, concerned uh, keeping the Lord's Supper and the correct way to do that. It concerned the head covering. And uh, it concerned the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, now, here we are dealing with Paul's answer to the Corinthians concerning their inquiry uh, on the gifts of the Spirit and their functioning in the church. And the subject uh, here where Paul deals with the gifts is how they are to function in the general assembly. When the church comes together in the assembly, how they're to function. Now, chapter 14, Paul emphasizes the value of prophecy over and above speaking in tongues unless the tongue is interpreted because his subject in chapter 14 is the edifying of the body when the church has congregated in one place. So Paul is not at all disparaging speaking in tongues. He's not at all saying that the church should not practice tongues. As a matter of fact, he says over and over again that uh, the church should not forbid speaking in tongues and uh, that he thanked God that he spoke in tongues more than they all did. And But what he is emphasizing here is uh, the importance of the edifying of the body. Uh, prophecy, preaching, teaching in a language that is understood by all. Now that's his subject, and I think that we have covered that uh, fairly thoroughly in uh, episode one and two in this series of altar chats on the gifts of the Spirit. <clears throat> so having said that, then let's go right now to uh, verse number 13, and this is where we pick up our study from where we left off the last time. So Paul says this, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. And as we have pointed out, many get excited about this word unknown, and they said that it should not be there, uh, but it should be because of verse 2 of this 14th chapter, where Paul says very clearly, he says here, for he that speaketh in a, now, the word unknown here is in italicized letters, meaning it's not in the original uh, text, the Greek text. It's added by the translators. It's called an interpolation, where they added words to uh, create a, uh, a more thorough understanding as the language comes out of the Greek into the English. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. So speaking in glossa, or speaking in uh, 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 glossais, which is the plural of glossa, speaking in tongues is, uh, is speaking in a uh, tongue or an utterance that no man understands. The speaker doesn't understand, nor does anyone in the building understand. In the assembly, no one understands. No man understands, and we can extrapolate this anywhere, any place, any time. No one understands. So these are not languages that Paul is talking about here uh, of other uh, human communities. The tongue that he is speaking of here is only a language by extrapolation of the meaning of the word tongue because it actually has reference to the tongue, not necessarily a language known of man. Somebody says, but isn't that different from the tongue that is spoken on the day of Pentecost where uh, the people that spoke in tongues uh, they spoke in languages, known languages, 
that uh, everyone there in the Bible names about 17 ethnicities that were present understood. Well, no, no, not necessarily. Because the miracle at Pentecost was not only in the speaking, but the miracle was also in the hearing. For the glossa, or the glosses that was that was being spoken by the 120, <clears throat> every person there heard every one of the 120 in their own dialect. The Bible says so. We hear every man in the language or in the dialect wherein we were born, and then it names 17. So Every one of the speakers, the 120, were heard in the dialect of everyone that was there. So the miracle was not only in the speech, but the miracle was also in the hearing. Now Paul says here clearly that no man understands without a miracle without uh, the uh, gift of interpretation, if you would, that we're going to talk about here in this study today. So every one of the people present on the day of Pentecost from all the 17 locales that, is, that are mentioned heard each one of the speakers in their own dialect. So it is a false dichotomy. It is a false comparison to claim that Pentecostals today who speak in tongues do not have what is experienced on the day of Pentecost because they are not languages of other human communities, but they are other tongues. And those naysayers want to call it gibberish. But look, it is gibberish to those who are not given the miracle of understanding. And here, the, the Bible says, in, and it's necessary that I say this, the Bible says in Acts 2 that they spake in other tongues. Now the word other there is heteros, and it means another of a different kind. Now, there are two uh, Greek words that are translated other into English, and they primarily mean, an, uh, alos primarily means another of the same kind. Heteros means another of a different kind. So if I am an English-speaking person, but I speak uh, Spanish, as a spiritual gift, or German, that's another of the same kind. That is another human language. Therefore, that would be an alos. But that's not what the people in the New Testament were speaking. They were speaking another of a different kind, a heteros tongue. Now, I think that that is an important point. And we've talked about this in, in other places. And here when we, in, in, I mean to say we, I talked about this in episode one and in episode two. But here, when we move into verse 13, this is a very important thing. Because when people speak in tongues, as it was in the New Testament, no man understands. No one has an understanding of what is being said. Because in the spirit, the speaker is speaking mysteries and is speaking to God. So speaking in glossa, or speaking in a tongue, glossa, or speaking in tongues, glasses, then it is always vertical unless there is an interpretation. And then when it is interpreted, then that that is in the vertical is brought into the horizontal and then it is on equal footing as his prophecy because those present then are being edified by what is being spoken. Now let's go to verse 13 and maybe we can get a deeper and more 
spiritual understanding of speaking in glossa or speaking in glasses. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Now, let me read the, uh, the entire group of scriptures here that pertain to this. For if I pray, verse 14, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. If I pray in tongues, my spirit's praying, but my understanding, I don't understand what I'm saying. What is it then, Paul says? I will pray with the spirit, which he has just identified as praying in glossa, or glasses, praying in tongues, and I will pray with the understanding also. In other words, it's important that I pray with my understanding as well as pray in tongues. I will sing with the Spirit, which is singing in tongues, or I will sing and I will sing with my understanding also. Now, what does he mean here? Well, we have to go back to verse 13. He is talking about praying, and, and the context is not in private prayer, but the context is in public prayer. Praying in the assembly. Wherefore let him that speaketh in a tongue, in a glossa, and the word unknown is added because he's already told us in verse 2 that no man understands him. Therefore it is an unknown tongue, an unknown utterance. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, he said, uh, for he that, let me read it again, for he that prayeth in an unknown tongue, let him pray that he may interpret. Who may interpret? Well, the speaker, the one who prays in tongues should pray that he interprets. That's not done that way normally in Pentecostal churches, and in that most Pentecostal churches are out of order. For if I stand in the midst of the assembly and pray in tongues, Paul instructs me to pray that I interpret what I have just prayed in tongues. Why? Verse 14 explains it. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So if my understanding is unfruitful, then so is the understanding of all that is hearing me is unfruitful. So Paul says, here's what I'm going to do. If I pray in an unknown tongue, he's talking about in the assembly, I'm going to pray that I interpret. That's what he means here when he says, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit or pray in tongues, and I will pray with my understanding also. So I'm going to follow my own advice, and if I pray in tongues, I'm going to pray that I interpret. For if I don't interpret, verse uh, 16 explains this more, more deeply. Else or otherwise, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, he's already identified that as, as praying in tongues or blessing in tongues. How shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing that he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily give us thanks well, but the other is not edified. So that's the whole point. For instance, if uh, in church we receive an offering and uh, I ask someone to stand and bless the offering. So when they begin to bless, they begin to bless in glossa or they begin to bless in tongues. And that often happens. And when that happens, then Paul says, now, when you do that, pray that you interpret. For if you don't interpret what you are praying in tongues, then how shall the rest of them in the room say amen to your prayer? He says, you, you give the blessing well, that's true, but they don't understand what you're saying. So pray that you interpret what you are praying so that they may say amen. And then Paul says in verse 18, I thank my God that I speak with glasses, or I speak with tongues more than you all. 
So he's not condemning speaking in tongues. He is saying that there needs to be some order and there needs to be some edifying along with it. So if uh, an individual prays in the assembly, gives a blessing over tongues or prays over someone who has come up for prayer for being sick or, or prays a blessing upon the sermon that's about to be preached. And if it is done in tongues, Paul says that person who is giving the blessing in tongues, who is praying in tongues, should pray that they interpret what is being prayed in tongues so that everyone else can be edified. Now, this is somewhat of an anecdotal story, but it happened to me two weeks ago. I have a, a, a saint in the church here who is uh, sick and under hospice care. And at 11 o'clock at night on a Thursday, I was called out to pray for her. And my wife went with me, of course. So when we went into the room, it was, a little, it was after 11, it was about 1130. And I began to pray for her when I uh, entered the room and I was praying in tongues. And I laid my hands on her and I was praying in an unknown tongue that no man understands. In the spirit, I was speaking mysteries and I was talking to God. And then this scripture came to my mind. That he that prays in an unknown tongue or gives a blessing in an unknown tongue should pray that he interpret. So then I prayed for the interpretation. And the interpretation was this. Physically rest and trust in me. That's what God was saying to the sister. Physically rest and trust in me. And I was praying in tongues for that physical rest and for her trust in the Lord. I had finished the interpretation and I had shared with her what the interpretation was. So I obeyed this passage. He that speaks in tongues should pray that he interpret. And uh, not five minutes, it was less than five minutes, my wife receives a text from one of our ordained ministers in the church who had been alerted to pray. And the text was, this is what the Lord told me in the spirit to tell her. Be still and know that I am God. Oh, hallelujah. When that prophecy, when that word of prophecy came forth over that text and my wife shared it with the room, we just had a Holy Ghost meltdown because that is exactly what my prayer in tongues for her was five minutes earlier. That's exactly what the interpretation of my tongue was five minutes earlier. To rest, be still, rest, be still. And know that I am God. Trust me. Trust me. Oh, hallelujah. Now, I know this is not done, but it ought to be done. This is not done often, but it ought to be done. When you pray in tongues over someone or when you're praying in church and you're asked to stand or bless the offering, bless the sermon or pray over somebody and you give, and you're pray, start praying in tongues, you should pray that you get the interpretation of that so that you can tell the room what you are praying. That way they can say amen. I had a sister this last week say, Brother Hayes, I got to look at that again because I've never heard that and I've never done that. Well, let's look at verse 13 again. Therefore, let him, can everyone say him? Let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he, can everybody say he? Pray that he interpret. So the him and the he are the same person. Let him pray that he interpret. Amen. So let's move on here. Verse 19. Verse 18, Paul says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. Then in verse 19, Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding uh, that by my voice I might teach others than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Well, obviously that's true because the instructions he's giving here 
is for the assembly. Brethren, be not children in understanding, albeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In other words, he's challenging them. Now let's be mature about this and, and recognize that the important thing is the edifying of the body. And then uh, verse uh, 21 uh, and verse 22 is really a parenthetical statement. We could pick up at verse 23 right after verse 20, and we would have the, uh, a, a complete thought uh, where it says, verse 20, Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. And then in verse 23, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in one that is unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? In other words, this is what he means. But come on, don't be children. Reason with me. Understand this. But now there's that parenthetical statement of verse 21 and 22 that we need to highlight here. Because uh, this is referencing a text from Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11, as a matter of fact, that is much misunderstood, especially among the Reformed theology people, those people who preach uh, cessationism, that the gifts have ceased, that they're no longer continuing in the church. That's a heresy, by the way. Amen. And if God ever did it, he still does it. If God ever confirmed the church with signs, wonders, and gifts, he's still confirming the church the same way. <clears throat> but let's look at it. We don't need to just skip over it because it's very important. Verses 21 and 22. In the law, it is written. Now, he's referencing Isaiah, and it's strange that he's calling Isaiah the law, but we're not going to get off in the weeds on that. In the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a shine, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them that believe. Now, when we look at Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 11, we see the prophet Isaiah says for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, and I'm going to paraphrase it, yet for all of that they will not hear. Now, the Apostle Paul takes that, that prophecy of Isaiah and brings it into his teaching on speaking in tongues. And he identifies it as having an application to speaking in tongues when he says, for with men of other tongues and stammering lips, will I speak unto this people, yet will they not hear me? Now the naysayers to the prophetic gifts and to the, to the supernatural gifts say that what the prophet Isaiah was talking about there, men of other tongues, meaning uh, non-Hebrews, non-Hebrews uh, uh, that would come from other countries and spoke different languages and would prophesy and preach to the people, but yet even because, in spite of their notoriety as orators or prophets, uh, still they're not, going to, they're, they're not going to hear. But that, according to Paul, that's not what Isaiah was prophesying about. What Isaiah was prophesying about was speaking in glossa, speaking in glosses, speaking in an unknown tongue for with men of other tongues. Now, if you look at Isaiah 28 and 11 in the Septuagint, because the Septuagint is the Greek Old Testament. So if you looked in the Septuagint at this text, other tongues here would be heteros, not alos, as it should be if it's just uh, other human languages, because it would be uh, another language of the same kind. You get that? For instance, English, German, Spanish, Italian, French, Russian, whatever. These are other alos, 
languages. Languages, uh, other languages of the same kind. They're human languages. Earthly languages. But heteros, which is how it is cast in the Septuagint, Isaiah 28 and 11, I mean. Heteros is the same thing in Acts chapter 2. Heteros, other tongues. Tongues are glossa of a different kind. Not human, not earthly, but heavenly. Some will disagree. That's perfectly okay. Perfectly okay. But I'm just exegeting the scripture as it is given to us. Then Paul identifies this heteros glossa, this heteros tongue, uh, as being prophesied about from Isaiah. So speaking in tongues just didn't pop up out of nowhere. It was foretold by the prophet. Verse 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not for them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophecy serveth not to them that believe not, but to them that believe. So glossa is for a sign to them that believe not. Well, they're not going to say a whole lot about this except point out two different dimensions of unbelievers, two different stratas of unbelievers, two different classes of unbelievers. Uh, it's a sign to the non-believer, here Paul says, speaking in an unknown tongue. Well, in Acts chapter 2, the unbelievers were the 17 uh, ethnicities that are mentioned there that heard the disciples speak in tongues and heard each disciple in their own dialect. Each one that was there heard each disciple in the own dialect in which they were born. So there's that class of unbeliever. Then in Acts 10, we have another class of unbeliever. And this class of unbeliever are the believers. <laughs> Here, the Jews that had received the infilling of the Holy Spirit with glossa, uh, glossais or tongues. Here, the Jews that accompanied Peter that had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, the Jews that accompanied Peter that were Christian believers. They weren't called Christians yet, but they were believers. Uh, when they when they heard Cornelius and his household speaking in tongues then their doubt was removed. Did they have doubt? Well, yes, they did, because, you know, God had to do a number on Peter to even get him to go to talk to a Gentile, let alone enter, enter a Gentile's house. But once they heard them speak in tongues, then Peter turned to those Jews, those of the circumcision that was with him, and said, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we. Now those of the circumcision that had believed in Christ were still doubtful that Gentiles could be received into the commonwealth of Israel, could be received into the faith. But tongues then was a sign to their unbelief. Because Peter said, how is it? Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? Can we forbid these to be brought into the church which have, we heard them speak in tongues. They received the Holy Ghost just like we did. Peter tells the disciples at Jerusalem in chapter 11 when he gets back there and is called on the carpet for going and preaching and baptizing Gentiles. So now we've dealt with that parenthetical two verses. Now we're going right to verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers 
will they not say that you're mad? Wouldn't that be interesting? And wouldn't that be true? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believe not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Amen. I have a, a friend uh, named Chris Reed, who is one of our bishops. We consecrated him in Texas City, Texas, uh, a few years ago. Chris is now the president of Morning Star Ministries. And Chris has a unique ministry in the prophetic of revealing the secrets of men's hearts, of uh, revealing information that only they know to them. And that's what is being talked about here in verse 25. If someone come into your assembly and someone operating under the gift of prophecy and reveals a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge and is able to read someone's mail, so to speak, and that's what uh, Brother Reed does, Prophet Reed does. Uh, he will tell a person, he will, he will call them out, and uh, he will uh, tell them where they lived 10 years ago. He'll tell them uh, their grandparents' name. He'll tell them about events that happened in their life years ago. Uh, and he, that's the first time he's ever laid eyes on them before. Why does he do that? How, why does God do that to create faith? in the heart of the believer, and, and, and Paul uh, explains it right here, and thus are the secrets of the heart made manifest, and so, so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth, for how can you know these things except God reveal them unto you? Folks, this is still happening. This is still happening. Amen. And uh, I would encourage you, to just go on Facebook and uh, uh, search for Chris Reed and uh, hook up to his ministry, Morning Star Ministries. And I'm not talking about somebody that can't be checked up on. I'm not talking about someone that uh, that uh, is a nebulous, uh, mysterious figure. This is a man, a public figure, very much in the public eye. Amen. And he's one of our bishops of the Apostolic Orthodox Church, president of Morning Star Ministries. Now, uh, other prophets in the past is, have operated the same way. Uh, and some will be upset when I mention this person's name, but I believe he was a prophet of God. Of course, he's dead now, but I'm talking about William Branham. And you can Google William Branham and you can Google his services and you can watch the videos where he's, where he's doing this to people. He's revealing the secrets of their heart before he prays for them so that they would acknowledge that God is at work and their faith would be excited and they would believe to receive their miracles. Amen. William Branham was oneness. And... Uh, so uh, is uh, Oneness Pentecostal. Amen. And uh, after he died, his followers went off the reservation. So don't blame William Branham for things that his father, that his Branhamites have done. I pray that I never have any Jerryites. I pray that I never have any Hays. My last name is Hayes. I pray I never have any Haysians running around after the Lord calls me home. For these are men that have inadequacies, but God uses them. I'm but a man that has inadequacies and full of contradictions at times. But at times, God has used me. And my gift is more in the area of teaching and being an exegete, a man of Holy Scripture. And uh, so here we all have our niche we all have our place in the kingdom of God. And if God ever did it, beloved, he is still doing it today. Now let's look down uh, at verse 26. 
And uh, the Bible says this. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, every one of you hath a doctrine, every one of you hath a tongue, every one of you hath a revelation, every one of you hath an interpretation. Let all things be done decently and in order. You see, Paul keeps coming back to this. This is the purpose of chapter 14, to teach the structure and to teach the order of the gifts of the Spirit and the functioning of the liturgy of the public worship service. So, oh, Brother Hayes, you use the word liturgy. Did you know liturgy simply means public service, public worship service primarily? Pentecostals, Baptists, they have a liturgy, open in prayer, song, service, offertory, choir, special singing, preaching, altar call, dismissal. That's a liturgy. And that can become very boring. Amen. Then we have the churches like the liturgical churches, the Anglican churches, that have a very high liturgy. And you can see by our altar vestments and my bishop's stole and the garment that I wear that the Apostolic Orthodox Church International has a liturgy. But what we do is, is we blend Pentecostal worship in with a liturgy. We have people falling out uh, in the spirit during our communion, in our Holy Eucharist. We have tongues and interpretation right in the middle of our liturgy. Amen. Often, very often. So liturgy, don't be afraid of the word. The word just simply means public worship service. So Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He said, when you all come together, he said, every one of you, uh, you, you, know, you have your own thing. Uh, you have your psalm you want to share. You have your doctrine, your pet doctrine you want to share. You have a tongue that you want to share. You, you have a revelation. You have an interpretation. He said, and he's not condemning these things. He's saying, uh, this is what, is, this is the reality of the thing. He said, but I want you to do these things in order and have some order about the way that you do them. Don't be interrupting one another. Don't be talking over one another. Don't think that what God's given you to do in the service is more important or, to, or should take precedent over what God has given someone else to do in the service that everything be done decently and in order. You'll have an opportunity to share your psalm. You'll have an opportunity to share your revelation. You'll have a, you know, we sort of homogenize this part of the New Testament liturgy down to Pentecostal testimony service. Where we have that portion of the service where uh, people are given an opportunity to stand and take two or three minutes to share their psalm, to share their revelation, to share their doctrine, to share, to share their testimony, to share whatever it is God has given them to share. It's right here. It's right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and in verse uh, 26. He says, but let's be in order about it. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Wow. Now this is some hard, fast rules right here. If anyone speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three. Here the Apostle Paul lays down a limit of the messages in tongues that should be given in any particular church service. He said uh, two is, is, is okay, three at the most is permitted, at the most three. So there should be no more, if we're going to be scriptural, there can be no more, than three messages in an unknown tongue in a particular service. And then the speakers are to speak one at a time, not speaking over one another. 
You know, she just said, every one of you come together, all of you got a tongue, all of you got this, all of you got that. He said, let it be decently in an order. Look, you'll have an opportunity. Uh, if any man speak in tongues, let it be. Let me, let me read it again. Let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and let one, let one interpret. Now, this is a little bit different than the speaking in tongues of verse 13 where Paul says the speaker who speaks in tongues should himself or herself pray that he or she interpret the tongue that they have given. This is a little bit different because in verse 13, 14, 15, and 16, he's talking about giving blessings in church. He's talking about praying over the offering. He's talking about praying over the preaching. He's talking about praying over the sick. He's talking about praying at different times for different causes or different reasons. But this is not talking about uh, that uh, use of tongues. This is talking about a message in tongues, a uh, uh, ad admonition that is coming from the Spirit in tongues. So here he's saying uh, three are the most that should be allowed in any particular service. Then he says, let one interpret. Now, what does this mean? Let one interpret. Well, it means one of two things. It means there should only be one interpretation for each message in tongues that is given. Or, most likely, it means let one interpret if tongues is given and if there's two messages or if there's three, let one interpret. Meaning, let one person give the interpretation of all three messages. The same interpreter, the same one that gives the, the one that gives the interpretation to the first message should give the interpretation to all three messages. There is another aspect. If one speaks in an unknown tongue, uh, and, and interrupts the, the, the flow of the service to do so, stands and just begins to exhort in tongues. And if there's no interpreter, no one gives the interpretation, then that message can come forth a second time. And if there's no interpretation, then that message can come across the third time. And then verse 28 addresses what is to happen next if there's no interpretation. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So in the case of there be no interpretation of any three messages, and that's the most that should come, then the speaker is to keep silence in the church and speak to himself and God. That doesn't mean that the speaker has to stop speaking in tongues. It just means after the third attempt, the speaker must stop interrupting the flow of the service. And if he feels the need or she feels the need to continue speaking in tongues, to do it in a prayerful way, in a private worship between he or him or herself and God, but don't interrupt the flow of the service. Keep silence in the church and just speak within yourself to God. Amen. Verse 29. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. Now he gives instructions to the prophets. When you come together, you all have a tongue, you all have a prophecy. Do it in course, do it in order. Let there be no more than three. Hey, if we got a hundred people and everyone's got to talk, everyone's got to have their piece of the service, you know, we're not going to get our farming done. We're not going to get our shops taken care of. We're not going to get our houses clean. You know, have some common sense. Be men. Don't be children in this. Be adults. That's what Paul is saying here. So he's saying, let the prophets also speak two or three and let the other judge. 
Now, when it says let the other judge, judgment needs to be in, uh, uh, in place over all prophecy to judge whether or not the prophecy is of God. Because people can stand and misuse and abuse the gifts and stand and just say, yea, thus saith the Lord, the, the moon is made out of green cheese. Well, that's to be judged. Prophecy, we are told, is for edification in verse 3 of this same chapter, is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. And if prophecy moves out of the perimeter of uh, either edification, exhortation, or comfort, then it's to be judged to be uh, an illegal prophecy. If prophecy is not to be used to weld an axe in an assembly when one member has an ought against another member. Honestly, I was in a service uh, years ago when somebody stood and supposedly gave a word of prophecy and said, Yea, yea, thus saith the Lord, and, and pointed the finger right at the preacher, Get thee off thy high horse and get thee on the ball. Well, some elder saint in the church stood and judged that prophecy as not being of God and, and said that person should be seated because they were just mad at the preacher. <laughs> Get thee off thy high horse and get thee on the ball. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm sure we feel that a lot of preachers are on too big of a high horse and they need to get to work in the kingdom of God. They need to come down off thy high horse and get thee on the ball. But feigning a function of the gift of the Spirit in order to do that is wrong. So Paul says, let the prophecies come two or three and he seems to put the limit of three here. He said, and, and let the other judge, the other prophets. I would that you all prophesy. Amen. Verse 30. If anything be revealed to another that setteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the subject are subject, uh, spirits of the prophets are subjects to the prophets. Now, people don't like that. Uh, somebody is preaching, and uh, somebody says, Ooh, 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 I got a word, I got a word, I got a word. Well, let the individual who is speaking finish. And then you can give your word. Oh, 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 but it's burning on me so hard. Oh, oh, I can't. I, it's like fire shut up in my bones and I cannot keep it in. I got to say it. So shut up, everybody, and let me talk. Look, don't be children. That's what Paul is saying. Don't be children. In malice, be children. But in the moving of the gifts of the Spirit, be men. You all can prophesy. Just hold your peace. Wait your turn. Oh, I got the floor now. I got the floor now. I'm going to preach for two hours and you just be quiet. What God's saying to you is not important. No. Paul says, if you're prophesying and God has revealed something to a brother or a sister, then give way. Find a place to land your plane and give way to what your brother or your sister is receiving from God. Amen. I like that, right? Don't you like that? The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, meaning the spirit of prophecy that is on you is subject to your good manners. It's subject to your common sense. Amen. Don't be children. Be adults in this. And I must hurry on. For God is not the author of confusion, verse 33, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Look, we come into church service and it, 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 the church, it just sounds like a flock of crows in a cornfield. Uh, no, let everything be done decently. 
and in order. Now, when he gets here, he goes in, he goes into another topic. He goes into another subject. It's not another subject, really, because he's still talking about He's talking about order, and he's talking about edification. He says, verse 34, and this might sound like an odd place to say this, but he says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now, does this mean? that a woman cannot speak in church? No, because the same apostle says that a woman may lead in prayer and she may prophesy uh, if her head is covered, if she is wearing a, a Christian head covering. In, uh, previously, in the 11th chapter of this particular book of 1 Corinthians. So we have to harmonize what Paul is teaching here with what he taught elsewhere. And I think a key is let your woman keep silence in the churches. Now, if we go back antecedently, just a, a very few verses, a very few verses where it says, um, uh, for if there be no interpreter, verse 28, for if there be no interpreter, let, uh, let him keep silence in the church. Now, and let him speak to himself and God. It doesn't mean that he cannot speak any longer in the church. He means he cannot interrupt the flow of the liturgy. That's what he means by keep silent in the church. Don't interrupt the flow of the liturgy. And that's exactly what he means here in verse 34, that a woman keeps silence in the churches. In other words, don't let her interrupt the flow of the liturgy. And it is not permitted for a woman to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience and to keep silence in the church. And verse 35 explains it further. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. And here it's talking about interrupting the flow of the liturgy. For if the apostles or the prophets were speaking, were teaching, were instructing, and a woman did not understand what was being said, uh, you know, and, and I've seen it. I've seen it. The woman will just speak up and, and, and say, you know, just interrupt everything. What are you talking about? And maybe in a church where the men sit on one side of the assembly and the men sit on the other, which is the type of church I grew up in, a woman would holler across across the, the, the church floor. Hey, George, what did he mean? Don't interrupt. It's a shame for you to do that. It's a shame for you to interrupt the flow of the liturgy. And if something's being said that you don't have an understanding on, wait till you get home. Ask your husband. Perhaps he has a better understanding than what you would have. But don't interrupt. Hey, George, what did he mean? No, don't do that. And verse 36, what? The question, what? Came the word of God out from of you or came it unto you only? No. Corinthians, listen to me. Are you the origin of, of the gospel? Are you the fountain from which the word of God put? Are you so important that what God has given you it must be heard over everybody else? Must be presented over everyone else? Don't be children. Be adults. Going back to what he said over here uh, in verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding, but be adults. Uh, in understanding be men. That, that's what he's talking about here. The word has not come out from you. You know, you're subject to the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy that you feel like you're giving is subject to your spirit. You can control it. You can handle it. 
you can you you can put the bridle on it and direct it into the church service and put it in the church service where it fits without interrupting the the liturgical flow of the service if any man verse 37 think himself to be a prophet or spiritual let him let him acknowledge that the things that i write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. You see, you can't say, oh, that's just Paul. That's just, no. Paul is an apostle of the Lord. He writes under the influence and the authority of the Holy Spirit. So the things that he is laying down, only three messages in tongues in a service. Let the prophet speak two or three. In tongues, only let one interpret. He that gives a blessing in the church over certain things and he does it in tongues, he needs to pray that he interpret so that the congregation will know what they are saying amen to. He said, now look, if, 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 if you consider yourself a prophet, you consider yourself spiritual, then acknowledge that what I'm teaching you, what I'm writing to you is the commandment of the Lord. Amen. Verse 38, but if any man be ignorant, then let him be ignorant. Oh, Lord, I feel like saying that so often. If you want to be stupid, just be stupid. If, if, if you want to remain uneducated, remain uneducated. If you're not teachable, then just go ahead. And that's what Paul is saying here. Verse 39, wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak in tongues. Don't get it mixed up, Paul is saying. I'm not saying don't speak in tongues. I'm just saying let there be structure. Let there be some edifying. Let any, and he finishes it here. Let all things be done decently and in order. Women, don't holler across the church to ask your husband what the preacher, preacher is saying. Don't speak up and interrupt the one prophesying if you feel like the Lord has given you a prophecy. Amen. Don't just keep interrupting the service with speaking in tongues if the interpretation hasn't come after the message being given three times. And after the third message in tongues is given, that's a cap. That's a cap. And one should interpret. Amen. The Lord bless you. Today's lesson's been just a little bit longer than the others. But we have gotten through. This ends our trilogy on the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, what I've shared with you is the exegeting of the scriptures going verse by verse expositorily through uh, 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. And we have used three videos to do that. So before I let you go, though, I want to draw your attention to the information box below. Please visit that. And uh, I need you to do four things. I need you to click like. I need you to click share. And if you haven't subscribed, I'm asking you to subscribe. And fourthly, I'm asking you to remember us with as generous of a love gift as the Lord will enable you to give. We need your help as we move forward in this teaching of the Word of God. You don't get this teaching anywhere else. You don't get it definitely in your churches. And on YouTube and on the internet and on social media, there's just so much fluff here. People are standing up trying to teach that have never sit to learn. Never sit to learn. You know, I'm not uh, uh, tooting my horn. Well, yes, I am. The Apostle Paul did, so let me meekly do it. When I was 12 years old, my pastor, O.T. Cottrell, walked into our Sunday school room and announced to uh, the Sunday school teacher, Sister Sue Reeves, 
Jerry will not be coming back to Sunday school class. Or, or these, Jerry will be with me from now on. And he took me out of the Sunday school department and set me on the front row uh, in his Bible classes. On Wednesday night, on Sunday, I was his adjutant. Uh, when he would go away to teach, I carried his Bible. I carried his briefcase. Uh, I sat under his teaching uh, until I was an adult. And then I went into full-time ministry, ordained at 18. And uh, then my undergraduate studies was in uh, Moody Bible Institute. My graduate studies was at Emmanuel uh, School of Religion and, uh, in East Tennessee. And uh, I, a full-time evangelist for many decades. As an evangelist, I was in the home of the premier pastors of the Oneness Pentecostal movement for decades. I sat around their table and heard them dis discuss scriptures until the small hours of the morning every day of the week for years and years and years. I got an education that not many have who are alive today. And uh, I'm sharing that with you. I have not stood up to teach before I sit down to learn. The Lord bless you. And if these lessons and if this teaching is important to you, share it with your friends Share it with your friends and subscribe so you don't miss anything. And please, we need your financial thoughtfulness today. The Lord bless you until we're together again in another altar chat. I am Bishop Jerry Hayes. I am presiding bishop of the Apostolic Orthodox Church International and the Abbot General of the Disciples of the Way, Apostolic. And it's my prayer, my friend, that the Lord all God Almighty sanctify you wholly in your mind, in your body, and also in your spirit. And I ask you, my friend, to go with God, and I bid you Godspeed.